Um, you touched on um, protectionist policies, and Melissa, I want to ask you, protectionist policies is also an issue with the Australian government, particularly when it comes to um, the purchase of Australia's farmland by foreign investors, uh, such as China, and more, more recently, Indonesia. Indonesia um, state-owned enterprises want to buy large swathes of Australian farmland uh, on which to raise cattle, so, um, which uh, can then be sent to Indonesia. Um, how can Prime Minister Tony Abbott, who is very supportive of these initiatives, um, handle the political pressures from um, members within his own coalition, the National Party, who are a bit more sceptical about foreigners buying Australian land? It is a really tricky, it is a really vexed question for the coalition and for the previous Labor government as well. They faced similar uh, concerns coming, uh, that they didn't have the, uh, the National Party uh, country based, uh, political base uh, to worry about, but a lot of the concern also comes from within metropolitan areas as well because of the uh, iconic status that farming has in Australia as being part of Australian history. So what you've had is uh, the previous government and the current government struggle to pull this line in, in, in wanting to be seen to address those concerns that are held in some farming communities, and, and certainly not all, because there are many farmers in the agricultural sector who are crying out for more foreign investment, but certainly there is concern within some farming sectors and within some metropolitan communities as well, but balancing that with the economic reality that Australia doesn't have the domestic capital base that it needs to achieve the sort of infrastructure and growth in agriculture and horticulture that it wants. So we saw the previous Labor government try and do this with, by, by beginning to set up a, an audit and a registry of foreign land. This was with the purpose of trying to demonstrate to Australians that the proportion of land owned by foreigners is actually quite small and, and the land that is owned by foreigners is largely owned by people from the UK, not from Asia um, uh, or, or from New Zealand as well. So that was a way of, of trying to show that yes, we're prepared to monitor it, but we don't see a need for action. It all went a little haywire during the election campaign uh, when the then Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, talked about uh, being an economic nationalist when he was asked a, a question about this issue during a, a public debate, um, which then saw uh, the issue being brought to the fore of the election campaign for a few days. And that certainly gave some encouragement to the nationals to continue to promote their policy, which the coalition has to abide by, and the coalition has reaffirmed since winning government that they want to reduce the threshold for foreign investment of agricultural land uh, to, that goes through the Foreign Investment Review Board. So that doesn't mean there's a, a block, but that just means that the threshold at which the Foreign Investment Review Board looks at it, uh, to lower it from uh, nearly $250 million down to $15 million, which if you're talking big cattle stations, $15 million doesn't really buy you that much. Um, so the challenge for Tony Abbott is to assuage the concerns of the National Party MPs who are concerned about this and, and metropolitan voters who are concerned about it, but at the same time not let that message infiltrate internationally because the coalition and many farmers who work particularly in the northern part of the country are, are well aware that uh, their, their stations are only viable if they are done on such a large scale that it requires large capital investment and that is more likely to come from overseas than from the domestic market. And further, the, f the federal government, uh, and this applies on both sides of the political spectrum in Australia, want to see more foreign investment, not just in uh, live cattle exports or, 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 in, uh, or even in agriculture itself, but they also want to see rapid development of horticulture in northern Australia. So we have things like the Ord Irrigation Scheme, which has begun, but they want further expansion, that is creating huge areas in, in northern Australia where there are massive monsoon rainfalls, to turn them into massive food growing areas where the idea is you could uh, have a horticulture on a scale we haven't seen before in Australia, uh, designed specifically to service a growing Asian market and that being seen as a future driver of the Australian economy 
once uh, the power in the mining boom winds out. So this is the long-term ambition of governments of both sides. So it's a very, very delicate balance for the coalition government to manage. Uh, at the moment, they're going okay, but it's very early days in the government and uh, once uh, uh, the nationals uh, find their voice, it's something that could very quickly splinter, so it's a hot topic. Deb Nath, you're our resident ad man. You can sell uh, anything. <laughs> I think I can. <laughs> but how would Tony Abbott... Uh, we've heard from both um, Harsia and Mel uh, that foreign direct investment is good. Um, both countries need it from um, you know, external sources. And we've heard from Mel as well that, in fact, countries like the United States and Britain are bigger buyers of agricultural land in Australia than countries like China and Indonesia. So how, if you were working for Tony Abbott, how would you sell that message? How would you advise that he sell the message to Australians that um, there's nothing to fear with countries like Indonesia investing in farmland? Before I try and <laughs> answer that very tough question, mm. I'd just like to go back to both of the comments that came across on the state of the economy. Um, my view, because of what I do, is that despite that big fuel price hike that came in so late, Russia, the reality is that consumer confidence in Indonesia is still running at world record-breaking levels. So a simple measure, a hundred on that indicator, basically means not confident, not unconfident just to know. We are post-election euph euphoria in Australia, we're at 120. I would say that in the course of the next 90 days, it'll probably taper off at 112, 115. Indonesia has been running at a 130, 150 brand, band for over three years. Now this is, you can't see this anywhere else in the world, certainly not in any G20 country. And the reason I bring that up is that despite the fuel price hike, that confidence, which we thought would get shattered, hasn't. It just dipped by four points one month in July, dipped by another four points in August, and then went back up in September. Now, what that illustrates to you is the consumer economy and its own power in that very large marketplace of 245 million people. Today, two-thirds of the economy two-thirds of gross domestic product is put, put together every year by the consumer, buying and selling things within the country. And that needs to be the focus. So from an Australian perspective, to completely ignore that is inexplicable. How we don't engage with a neighbor that has a stable 15-year-old democracy, that has a marketplace with that level of consumption, let, let me give you an example. If you take $3 a day per capita expenditure as the World Bank indicator for middle class as a definition, then we know that in Melbourne, in Canberra, well, sorry, in Melbourne, I couldn't get to work on my commuter train. Forget about coming back. <laughs> but you, we also know that if you take that same $3 and spend it in a village outside Jokowi's small city of Solo, you can feed the whole family. So if you take what I think is a more credible indicator that will explain things in a developing world context, take a television set, uh, a refrigerator, a motorcycle, or a car. Now, three of these four things were owned by just 24% of Indonesian households as recent as five years ago. Today, at the end of this year, it will be 60%. Now that's real consumption. That's not hope, aspiration, dream. It's real, and that's the way it's growing. If you take, for example, the flip side, if you take mobile phones, today 85% of the population has a mobile phone. Only one in three Indonesians are regular users of the internet. Only 6% of that 33% bought anything online. 
last year, 2012. And that added up to $2 billion, half the size of New Zealand in the same year, one-fourth the size of Australia in the same year. But the way it's going, it'll have gone past New Zealand this year, and it'll probably catch up with that trajectory. In five years, it'll have caught up with Australia. Now, these are opportunities that are real, that don't need, the point I'm trying to make, it doesn't need mega billions in foreign direct investment. It really needs, or certainly, when you look at the e-commerce potential of Indonesia from an Australian perspective, you'd want to see more Australian e-entrepreneurs engage now because it's early days.